I'm John Dobas. I'm from Forbes. I'm here to, we're talking today about uh, what, uh, options trading, options selling in real time. Does everyone here uh, sell options at least sometimes, a couple times a month? Good. We have a room full of it. Uh, people who do buy rights, put rights, put spreads, some other credit spreads, debit spreads, more exotic things that enrich uh, E-Trade, Charles Schwab, and, and they're, they're the ones behind this. Uh, what, so uh, what I try to do I, I, is to take an uh, integral philosophy to creating investment income from stocks that I wouldn't mind getting stuck with for the long term if that happens. Because if you do these trades long enough, you know that uh, the market, uh, one of its uh, truisms is that it has a tendency to make the greatest fools out of the greatest numbers of people possible. And uh, no matter what the market is, uh, corn futures, gold, oil, uh, uh, debt contracts on uh, uh, bundled securities that represent home mortgages in 2007. So uh, what I choose is the underlying securities, uh, it, the asset class, dividend paying stocks. So I'm looking for you know things that you might find in the uh, VIG, those ETFs like that, dividend growth. But I'm also looking really for uh, higher yielding things because if we, if we do go through a nuclear winter of price returns, you, at least you could fall back on the dividend income. And then if you can earn some premium income along the way, you can do yourself further favors and at least put yourself in a better position when we come out of the worm at the other end and, and let's be it honest, when you're in stocks, you're in it for at least seven, you know, five to seven year period. Uh, although we've been rewarded in much shorter time frames but more recently. So my asset class of choice is, is uh, dividend income. Uh, I'm the editor of the Forbes Premium Income Report in addition to being the Forbes Dividend Investor Editor. Uh, we started up the Premium Income Report in March 2014, five and a half years ago. We've closed out of 950 positions and we've been able to achieve a 29.4% average annualized return on all, the, on all the positions where we don't own a stock or have an option short or anything, but we're all done with them. We carry some people, we carry some wounded buddies across the, you know, uh, across the desert too. But when we get to the other side, these have been our results. Nobody's really, you know, well, there have been some instances. AMC theaters, anyone ever touched that stock? AMC? Just don't do it. Um, or have a risk management set up in place. So anyway, things have gone well. And just because I think the strategy is, a, it may, is one that makes sense, where you look for stocks that pay regular dividends. They're not, you know, dicey companies that will they or won't they. Uh, in fact, you can count on them raising the dividends. So you want uh, cheap stocks relative to history. That, this is bio stuff. I'm a University of Florida graduate. I've worked for Lou. Uh, Lou's still going on. He's still uh, he's still going on, and uh, he's a great guy from Harvard. Steve Forbes, a little bit different personality there, to be sure. Both very smart guys. Honored to work for him. Jim Michaels, the guy that I that was he he had just stepped down as the editor of the magazine. He was editor top editor from uh, the, the Kennedy presidency, 1961 to 1999. So he saw quite a nice swath of history, and he was a pithy guy. He get, handed out Orwell's. If you, you ever want to write something well, uh, Google Orwell's Rules of Good Writing. Uh, Jim Michaels was a, was a purveyor of that, a pithy guy. He broke the word that uh, Gandhi was assassinated in India in uh, 1948. So uh, Jim, one of the things he created after he stepped down was the Forbes Investment Newsletter part of the company. Uh, we've got uh, about 15 to 20 newsletters, our own, which I do, and Tasik Yoon, maybe some of you subscribe to Tasik. Janet Brown, she's no stranger to these uh, money show investment conferences. Brad Thomas, he'll be on a little bit later today with me. Larry McMillan. So Forbes, in addition to uh, trying to, you know, uh, innovate and stay ahead of the curve in what journalism, whatever it is, whatever that means these days is, um, we also make money by, by, by selling these things. And it, and it keeps me going, so that's great. And I've got a kid in college, so I'm gonna, I keep going at it strong. Uh, if you do a strategy where you own dividend-paying stocks, those that pay you quarterly, and then you write maybe quarter, uh, covered calls that expire every 45 days, you can do that eight times per year. So you could theoretically generate 12 payouts, which would equate to you know once a month, if you want to look at it that way, from your stocks. If you want to earn income as an investor, you've only got a couple of ways to go, dividend paying stocks or selling options on stocks. Uh, I'm, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't want to know here. How much time, we, this is a shorter, Tracy, uh, this thing ends, I believe, at five, uh, or at 3.30, so, Right now we are at 253. Okay, we're fine. We can ease into it still a little bit more, but not not greatly. 
So uh, because a lot, of, a lot of investors calculate returns simply as the price change. Obviously, there's, that ignores quite a bit. If, you, if you've got a dividend paying stock, you've got to add those in. And then if you're selling premium frequently on the stock, you've got to include that too. Uh, but basically, every time you do it, maybe not for an IRS purpose, but for an economic purpose, every time you receive a dividend or uh, sell some options for premium, you're reducing your cost basis. You're reducing what you've got extended of yourself financially in that stock. So that, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I mentioned we're, we're hitting about 29.4% for our closed positions. You could be a comatose investor. And since 1926, uh, the year Johnny Carson was born, actually, too, and Don Rickles, uh, let's put it in perspective, 90, 93 years ago, 10% uh, a year from, from large cap stocks, 12% from small caps, a little bit rougher of a ride. So if you're going to do anything where you don't separate yourself from your garden hose or your grandkids or something not involving stocks, it better get you at least 10% a year on a reliable, you know, on a reliable basis. Otherwise, why monkey around? Uh, since 1996, the same story, you know, stocks uh, have outdone uh, fixed income securities. Anything you want to get into, any stock, any asset you have better pay you at least, you know, three and a quarter percent. That's been the average U.S. inflation rate for the last 110 years. Uh, I'm sorry, 100 years, and uh, currently we're only at uh, we're kind of not even pushing 1.91 percent, but uh, that was two months ago. So uh, if you own a portfolio of stocks, the only way you can expect things to go better for you is if earnings increase, if dividends grow, or if the multiples have expanded. We've had a little bit of all three of those in the last three years. But sometimes that you know a couple of them sputter. But if you've always got that dividend growth, if you look for a stock that's conservatively financed, that doesn't that generates consistent cash flow in excess of what it pays out in dividends, you know it's probably going to be okay. Kids that do well in high school tend to do well in college, and then, and, and so and afterward, there are rare, you know there are cases where people turn it around. But uh, anyway, you want to look for a successful company that's well financed. Uh, let me get past all this stuff here. This is, these are, you know, things to worry you. U.S. debt. This goes back to 1980. When President Reagan came in, we were at about 42% of national, uh, of the, of GDP for our national debt. Not blaming the old Gipper, but I would blame the whoever came in about 2007, 8. Ooh. Well, Trump and Obama, I guess. But you can see there, we're now at 105% of GDP. So, I mean, that's something to consider too about whether you should own physical assets like a and, and and I don't know what the truth about global warming is but when you're talking about investing you know you're, you're talking about a lot of things you know security overall security what if leftists what if the revolution you know what if people come after you for your money are you ready to defend you know things like that so uh, but I guess there's always been that fear out there the night you know during the depression that was the case and now you add this element of, hey, you got a nice condo down in Boca? Eh, check on it in 12 years. <laughs> Little girl from Sweden told me, how dare you? Um, I digress. Uh, but, but, but really, I mean, when you're talking about some theory of options trading and dividends and whatever you're doing, you know, well, does it make sense? You know, but anyway, I think it does because you don't know what's going on. Is there, we, when Trump came in, we, we all thought, oh, here we, here it comes. This is the turn in interest rates we've all been waiting for, ladies and gentlemen. Then they went back down to 1.5% of the 10 year treasury just about a month and a half ago. Uh, now we're back up to 1.7. But the point is, uh, yet, what did I say earlier about the market wanting to make the greatest fool out of the greatest number of people possible? Um, and then you have, you know, you, the, all these uh, psychological impulses that cause people to behave malappropriately along the way, too. You know, uh, as the market, you know, as it comes out of the last crash, nobody believes stocks will ever go anywhere again. And if, then they hear, hey, you know, my buddy's uncle's stepson's aunt made a couple bucks and I'd be, oh, really? And then, then, then the chatter, you know, and I don't know where we are really along this. Are we in the denial phase, that far, that far right, the blow off phase? I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I, I point out some of these factors just because in history we've seen a lot of these things happen before. They may not, you know, may not repeat, but it rhymes. So th through all this murkiness and fogginess and cloudy times, what do you do? How can you make sense of it? I say go, go for dividend stocks. Buy cheap stocks, get paid to wait. Uh, big source of total return when your portfolio is going nowhere as far as prices. Um, I go for value stocks. Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, the idea of the margin of safety. 
uh, we're still cooking along here. Yeah, we're good. We've got a, uh, the idea and whatever model you create, I've created one to, that helps me identify this, but whatever you use to find out that, that 45 degree line in the middle is what a stock is really worth. And then sometimes it's uh, obviously the market will assign a price that's too low or too high and you want to get in when it's too low. Um, I look at the things. Oh, well, another guy that uh, whose, whose theories I, I employ, uh, or at least what some of his insights, Peter Lynch, he was the manager of the Fidelity uh, Magellan Fund from 1977 to 91, 22 and a half percent annualized return over that stretch of time. Market was going up, but, but he, he beat it like a like a redheaded stepchild, as they say. Um, uh, he didn't create the uh, peg ratio, but he really employed it a lot and wrote about it. Peter Lynch did. You take the P, you know, you look at a stock. Oh, a PE of 30. It's, you know, bloated, too, too far, you know, way too expensive for me. But if a company is growing, obviously, the, the higher multiple is warranted. That's what the PEG, the peg ratio, uh, states in, a, in an equation format. Take the PE divided by the long term growth rate, which fill in whatever you think it should be. Analysts publish it, but. You don't know who's going to make the uh, the final wild card yet for the AL. I don't think for the playoffs. How can you know what a company is going to grow in five years? So uh, what what he did do, what Lynch did, was add the Y. The, the Y stands for yield. So instead of taking the PE divided by the growth growth ratio, take the PE divided by the growth ratio, uh, the growth rate plus the dividend yield. What it tells you, academically at least, is that dividend paying stocks are cheaper than other stocks just because they pay dividends. So, uh, and then also smaller stocks and value stocks do outperform in the long run. This is confirmed by a lot of people, but uh, there's a, some real academic heft behind the ideas here with uh, Fama and French at the University of Chicago. So uh, I, I, I go for this you know, approach where I look at, I'm not gonna go into the, uh, how many slides of that do I, I'll, I'll cut it down a little bit. But basically the dividend payout ratio, that's one thing you wanna consider, right? What is the company paying out relative to what it uh, brings in? Uh, the classic is the dividends per year divided by the earnings per share for the year, but not all earnings are cash. So what you would want to look at also in conjunction or even in replacement would be the free cash flow per share and see if that's consistently higher over time than the uh, dividends per share. And if so, you've probably got a, a, a company that's going to be able to continue to do that. Also, now that now you can't go the, on a chart and hit 10 years to look back and see what happened to the dividend or the stock price to see what happened in the last recession. We're now past that point. We're, you know, the last, the bottom of the bear market was March 9th, 2009. So now anyway, you got to hit a longer, if you got a, one of those uh, data visualization uh, sites where you can extend back the time period and then look at various factors like dividends. I use Y charts, uh, Morningstar does it as well. Anyway, you want to see what happened the last time around that you know what hit the fan. Did these guys, were they able to consistent, did they weather the storm? Some, you know, then there, there were a lot of people who, who got hurt, uh, a lot of uh, companies that got hurt and had to cut the payouts. But you know what? Sorry, I don't want you playing with my kids. Uh, so uh, the dividend yield, obviously, I want a higher dividend yield, but what's more important even the, is, is dividend growth. That's, that's factored into the model. Revenue growth. You may not get revenue growth for the, uh, the last two years then in, into the next one year uh, of projections, but look for the, some possibility that this loser is going to grow again. You look at a stock like uh, L Brands, which is the Victoria's Secret uh, parent company, and they've had a consistent problem selling their underwear. Um, uh, similar story at, at, at Hanes Brands, although Hanes has, has come along uh, a little bit better than LB. In any case, uh, after all this process of screening, I create a, a portfolio. This was the portfolio from a week and a half, two weeks ago now, three weeks. But um, I, I, I'll be happy to send this to anybody who emails me and wants it. Uh, uh, ranked in, de in descending order of attractiveness. The, it looks a little bit too complex. Looks like the matrix here. I guess it is what it is is the matrix. But I'm looking for the, those. What you want are negative numbers there. That tells you what the percentage discount is to the price to uh, sales ratio, the price to book value ratio, price to earnings, enterprise to uh, value to EBITDA, and then price to cash flow per share. Those five metrics are what I consider your your. Uh, Pillars of value, if you will. What are those? And, and, and like I said, if it's growing, if, it's, if a company's growing, they can be a little bit higher. Uh, the, the, the discount can be can be 
smaller to the five-year average. That's what I compare it to. So anyway, that's the that's where I start out as a bunch of stocks to, to see. Hey, can I sell some? Can I do a buy right here? Is this you know trading near a strike price where I'm going to get some decent premium? Can I get out of it? Does this you know what can I? Is there an option that's attractive to sell that will expire before the next earnings report? Because as good as you like these guys, you may not want to stick around when when they go to court, so to speak. Um, uh, on all positions, it's good to have it a, a, a level at which you tell yourself, I don't care what you know is going on, I'm leaving this party at 11 o'clock or whatever. Uh, with these stocks, if, you, if, you, if they've descended 10% or more from the highest closing price since you've owned it, it's, you know, that's, 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 what I, that's my policy. So uh, uh, you will lose some stocks, but you can get back into them after maybe you see that they are appealing again due to insider buying or... Uh, some some new information, but you got to be passionate, you know, dispassionate, like uh, Michael was down in Cuba, 1959, with his brother, Godfather fan. Okay, so now we've going good. We've got 25 minutes left. So the idea here is, uh, you take these great dividend-paying stocks that you found, looking at you being a smart value investor, uh, and, and that's great. And you probably stop there, but if you want to really uh, see if you can get into trouble, uh, no. If you want to. Uh, uh, enhance your return, really. I mean, you, price change plus dividends divided by price paid. But hey, let's add a new component. Throw in some options premium. Yes, you may mi miss out. You may miss out if a stock, you know, unexpectedly gets a buyout offer and is up 25% on the day, but you just sold something at the money, you know, a covered call. So you're, you're like Fred Sanford. But... Um, Keep your, what I believe is looking uh, at the short term to earn a respectable return. If you can stack up a bunch of 2.5% um, returns every 30 days, that, that comes out to uh, 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 that comes out to a 30% annualized return. Um, we got weekends to consider. I, I, the way I, so, but the way I, my formula to annualize a return is to take the raw return, the raw total return, which would be capital gains and dividends, and, and, and premium, whatever you got, divide, uh, multiply that by 365, and then divide by the number of days. So, uh, and obviously, if you can lock in something that looks good for a longer period of time, you can uh, accept a lower level of return. But you want to shoot for something, like I said, that's going to work out to much more than 10% a year, because that's what you could earn if you were just on the couch watching episode uh, reruns of uh, Columbo which are abundant these days. I don't know if anybody's got, uh, got the knack to watch Peter Falk in action, but he's a master. Um, so is Jim Rockford, uh, Jim Gardner. So yeah, but, but like I said, if you can, if you can earn two and a half percent a month, you need to think, oh man, I just made, you know, what, 120 bucks on uh, uh, $5,000 uh, at risk for a couple of weeks, you know. It's not, it doesn't sound like a lot, but, but doing it over and over again, my point is you can compound to something beautiful. I already had a slide about that, but what I do primarily, I, we do some put spreads, but that requires you to be uh, correct about your vision for the future in two dimensions, you know, price and time. And, and, and I know you can, you can maneuver your way and you can uh, roll ahead and uh, roll down and that. But, uh, but, but like I said, I'm, I come at it from the, from the uh, fundamental perspective anyway for the underlying securities, so I'm not that exotic. So put rights and buy rights kind of get me going. Uh, and then once, they, once the options expire, you can write additional covered calls on the positions. Or uh, if you're uh, approaching an earnings report that you think is going to be especially turbulent, you could, if you've got a little nice little profit, you could sell it outright. Or you could purchase some puts purchase some protective puts just slightly out of the money ahead of the earnings report to get you over the hump. Uh, many times you find out that they are fairly priced, <laughs> but sometimes it's like when the house catches fire, you don't, you're, you're glad to have the insurance. Um, so I don't need to I'm preaching to the choir here, I guess a little bit, but why would you, uh, a, a buy right is when you're simultaneously purchasing the underlying security, the stock, and then selling the calls. You do it for a net debit. You, you buy uh, Intel for fifty dollars, and you sell some calls that expire next month for one dollar. Your net debit would be forty nine dollars, and and if you get taken, if you and if it was a fifty dollar call that you sold at the money, uh, you you could make one out one out of forty nine at risk. So you're making about a little bit more than two percent. 
Sorry, that was like, uh, uh, but you see what I'm saying, right? Because you, you spent 50 for the shares and you got a dollar. So you're only, you're only out 49. And if you wrote it at the money, and then in this kind of environment where things are so, actually it's been quite bullish for a lot of stocks, but the, the, the volatility has been, has, has been quite high and, and investor nerves are a little bit frayed. So taking, you know, a dollar profit on 49 for 10 days, for a, a month, Sounds quite appealing. Load up on it, you know. But um, you know, there's the the Black Shoals option pricing model. I know there's a, a lot of Greeks that. But here, here, really, you need to focus on these three. The other ones are important too. But the intrinsic value, obviously, the amount that an option is in or out of the money, uh, it means quite a bit. The time value, you know, as that's our friend. We're we're selling these options, so we want that time value to bleed out like a like a busted transmission uh, leak pan or whatever you call that thing after after a rough ride over some stumps down in Georgia. That's what you know, we, we but that, that and that's what you get by the way in that 30 to 45 day period prior to the expiration of the options is if it's not going to, you know, as time it's like uh pulp fiction fans anyone when uh, when he tells Butch you're going to go down in the fifth. If you were going to be a champion it would have happened by now. But it, but uh so the option, as it gets closer to expiration, if it's not near near the money, you know that the chances of him making it are, <laughs> that, that's, and that's what delta, and then you got uh, other. So, and then then the uh, the volatility value. You're going to get a lot more money for selling pr an option on a stock that's all over the place because there's a l bigger chance that that stock's going to end up in the money. Um, but a lot of times there's a, if you look at, if you're doing this just from the perspective of looking at, in, uh, you know, the uh, historical volatility and the implied volatility, and if the implied is greater than the historic, wow, hey, there's, hey, I, I, they, they told me at this, at this option school to sell premium. Mm -mm. I, I sold the premium and I got, now I got whatever, fill in the bad position you're in. Um, so, like I said, the, I encourage anybody that's doing these kinds of trades to, uh, so look at what's what you're possibly getting into, you know, the AT and T, whatever the underlying security is. Um, but ba here's the under, you know, this is the mantra that you have to live by. You're earning money today for your pledging to do something in the future, to buy or sell a stock at whatever that price is on the contract, the strike price for a fixed period of time. You know, it's like if on any asset, I get, you know, you can you can buy an option on real estate. They don't trade the way that these options. You know, if you say, hey, I'd like to buy your house for four hundred thousand dollars, I'll pay you I'll pay you twenty thousand dollars, and let me buy it for four hundred for the next year and a half. And you go, oh, I don't know, about that. So, but here it's it's standardized. It's been that way since nineteen seventy three. Um, uh, one, so you come at it from a fundamental point of view anyway, and you say, hey, I'd like to buy all these stocks. They're, they meet my, you know, uh, value criteria. Well, just by definition, if you, if you sell options to get into those, those stocks, you're going to be doing so at a price that's lower than the current market price. You know what I'm saying? If you went out and bought all those stocks at the current market price, you would have had your portfolio. But if you said, hey, I'm going to get into this, via selling some puts, doing a buy right. Uh, I'm going to pay attention to when the dividends are coming, when the earnings reports are out, to so know when things are going to be really volatile. Um, you can, that's your way, I, I, think, I think that's a great way to, you know, if, you don't, if you're not going to set up a portfolio fully stocked, you know, instant, right away, that's a good way to get into it, you know, is to do these trades for, for a few weeks or months or whatever, then not to use the analogy about throw it on the wall and see if <laughs> see what drips off or however that goes, but uh, but but really, because after you do this, you're going to have a portfolio of stocks that you ended up owning after the options expired anyway. You can sell them for a profit or a loss, or you can keep on going, and that's what I that, that's what I choose to do usually. Um, you know, the options are 100 uh, represent 100 shares. I'm not going to bore you with that. 313. We're still moving along at a good, very uh, nice pace. Uh, you know what call and put options are. If you don't, you wouldn't have raised your hand that you're trading them. If you should, you should be have your licenses revoked, I guess. Um, uh, uh, contract terms, you know there's a strike price and expiration. So, um, and why would you sell calls? I guess you guys already do a lot of that anyway. You earn money from stocks that you already own. You know, if you, if you, and this works beautifully if you're in a range bound condition, if the stock's always going from 32 to 34, 32, you can kind of, when it gets towards that 34, you can sell the call. And then uh, when it gets down below, you could either buy back or have it expire, or rinse, lather, repeat. Um, lather, rinse, repeat. Uh, really, you should make it worth your while. Like I said, if you can, 
you need to be earning at least 10% annualized. Otherwise, just throw it in an index fund because uh, no one gets hurt that way And the, so far. Uh, this is an important graph to consider, and so is this one here. The, these are the profit loss diagrams for a covered call and for a put right. Notice that both of them have a limited profit potential, and then the loss is considered substantial. It's not total because if, you know, the worst case, you own something and then you've written a covered call against it, it goes from, uh, you know, 150 to zero. You don't go to zero, you go to zero plus whatever premium you earned. So it's a parachute, but one that deploys about maybe 20 feet above ground. You won't, you won't have knees. Um, so, so uh, and I've heard it said before about these strategies about selling covered calls and, and, and puts. Oh, it's a defense, defensive. I'm like, defensive? Are you kidding? I feel like the playoffs? It's not defensive at all. I mean, I, it's defensive in the regard that your cost basis is less uh, than it would have been if you didn't sell them. But it's not going to protect you from peril. So, um, you know what? Before I came down here, I, I just sent out this trade. And let's go to the videotape. Um, AT&T presents well for another buy right with dividend due early October. How about a hand for the uh, the kid who was in rehab three times, but now is going to Harvard? AT&T. Uh, th remember, this stock couldn't get out of its own way for a long time. Stuck below 30 bucks. It's at 37.50 now. Uh, about a month, about five weeks ago, we had uh, done a buy right, buying the stock and then selling an October 18th covered call, and. Uh, Oh, you're not even looking at my. Uh... How do you? No, no, no. That's not. That's that's Wendy. Uh, how do you change the, the screen that they're viewing? Uh, well, I could. I'm toggling here. Let's see. We got... Oh, you know what is it? it? First of all, there you go. Get it out of that. And now, for the real magic, ladies and gentlemen. Nope. There you go. AT&T presents well for another buy right with dividend. Uh, we, we had done, so uh, early assignment. Everyone's familiar with the concept of early assignment. Yeah. Uh, if, if, there, if, if there's more time, if the time value exceeds the dividend, you may not be exercised early ahead of an ex dividend date. But if it's the other way around, uh, if there's if the option, if, if hanging on is more valuable, you won't get assigned early. But if you do, what the heck? Okay. <coughs> Document recovery. Yeah, here we go. So what I said was, you buy 200 shares of AT&T. I try to keep these trades around $5,000 in size. Uh, we were only earning $45 per contract for the uh, op option, so I wanted a bigger number to look. You know, I want to be. I don't want. So anyway, two, two. I don't think it's. I think it's a very conservative trade myself. AT&T was trading right around 37.50. It was at 37.40. And um, so here we go. There it is. Ladies and germs, we've got the, uh, uh, I don't know if you can read all that, but what we, we bought, it says 100, but we bought 200 shares of AT&T, then trading at 37.38, uh, it was closer to, th anyway, 3738, and we sold the 37.50 calls, only 10 cents out of the money, but as I said, sometimes I'd, I'd rather put the cash in my pocket than discuss the merits of a particular particular strategy. And we sold, they were bid at 45, asked at 46, nice tight spread right there. Um, so we could probably get 45, 46 for them. So uh, the, I, I said do the trade for a net debit of uh, 36.95 or lower. So what happens in the, in the following, in the future, if uh, under various scenarios? AT&T now is trading 37.40, 37.38. We're at the 3750 uh, October 18th expiration, so we've got 22 days to go. The dividend has not been announced. We just did it, I just, room 1207. Uh, <laughs> no, I did. I, I arrived and I had to go park the car. I'm like, oh my God, it's getting late. The subscribers are waiting for my. So, yeah, the, 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 what makes this attractive is that the dividend is not small for a $37.40 stock, it's 51 cents per share. So, you got a nice little dividend coming, and, and we earned about 45 cents in premium per call for, for selling these 3750s. I use this site called stockoptionschannel.com. It's free, um, but it gives you, you know, 
it talks about the Greeks in English terms, uh, in other words. So anyway, so we bought the stock, 37, let's call it 40, sold the 45, for 45 cents, so we're down to 36.95. What happens in the future under these uh, scenarios? If we earn the dividend and we are assigned an expiration, we would earn uh, 105 per share on 36.95 at risk, right? Get it? Because we, we had 36.95 at risk, so if, if we get taken out of this and we have to sell at 37.50, we're going to earn that 55 cents plus the 51 cents from the dividend per share. So I, uh, I, I rounded down anyway. So the 105 divided by 36.95 is 2.8%, and that's over a 22-day period. Annualized, that's 47%. So that's a pretty, if, they, if all works out well that way, that will have turned out to be an efficient deployment of capital for the next three weeks. Um, if, if, if at and is, is, is substantially above the 37.50 strike price um, before this ex dividend date, which will probably be October 10th, a week before expiration, we'll earn only 1.5%. But uh, and I didn't give the annualize. It's probably something like uh, 28 or something low. But, but, it, but uh, and, and the, the doomsday scenario is, you know, Trump launches investigation of AT&T in Ukraine or something. And, and, it, and, it, and, 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 and things happen. Like anybody who did this with Boeing shares, you know, was uh, things... Uh, I prefer to do the more liquid. With AT and T, it wouldn't matter as much. Every every contract's pretty liquid, but you get into some uh, stuff. Well, then again, if it's not really heavily traded, it wouldn't have the weeklies to begin with. But sometimes you see weeklies with no volume. I don't like that. For my own self, I can go in there and like you put in a limit price, like a an fu price, if you will, you know. And if you yeah, yeah you not got filled the other day, yeah. Uh, but but no, I, I prefer the monthlies just because there's more. Although I will, I will say, as I mentioned before, I like to be I like to be out of these positions prior to an earnings report coming out. So if you need to massage things uh, that way, if it, you need to sell the October 11th because the re earnings report is October 15th, and that is the case with the with something we had here recently. Uh, these are so these are all of our positions that we have going on right now. These are the closed trades here. We've got 900 and geez, what's the bottom sell here? A 900. 59, oh, wow. And then we've got uh, about 110, 150 uh, positions there. But you can see the total return here for these, even for these things that we're still sitting in. Oh, what the heck is that? Is that I bet you that's new core. It is new core. However, so that's misleading because here's an instance of, uh, so new core busted out to uh, a 50, not a, oh, a 52 week or year to date high. It was, it's done well beautiful technically, started to pull back from like 50, 55-ish. We bought it at 53, you see that? We sold the 53 53.10, sold the in the money by one dime strike price, uh, $53 uh, call for 135. That's gonna, that expires to this gentle lady's uh, point about on the 11th because Nucor reports on the 15th. So we don't wanna be holding that bag of potential uh, bad stuff and so anyway we got but so and we purchased also we purchased just to because i thought yeah i don't trust this guy um a 50 dollar put that expires at the same time so the worst we could have done if we you know is to have to sell at 50 and our cost base is, is 51.90 so you know that's a that, that, that equates to a scrape on the knee falling off your big wheel that's not a, a huge injury um I don't have one of Disney. I could, well, let's, we could go to Disney and see what's going on. I mean, not literally go to Disney, but we could, we could go to E-Trade and see what's going on with Disney. Uh, DIS. Disney already had a decent move, though, off of its lows, right? It's, yeah. So here we go with Diz. Disney's at 131. Here's the thing, E-Trade, you know, they're not the best, but they sure provide all the stuff that you need to look at in one spot. Uh, the ex-dividend the, the ex date, the earnings date, the dividend amount, that's about it. Uh, so the next earnings date for Disney is 11-7, November 7th, 
uh, and it's got an ex-dividend date. Last one was July 5th, so the next one should be October 5th, and the payout should be at least 88 cents per share, which is what the, what the last one was. So let's go to the uh, options grids. And they're, they're reporting is oh, November 7th. So we could either, uh, November 1st, I bet has got some action. Let's see here. Oh yeah, they've got tons of action. So um, what you could do, the dividend, so the dividend is going to be 88 cents per share. That's a nice incentivization to. Oh, is it semi-annual? They pay only semi-annual, huh? Oh, it's good to be there. So this is a good time to hang. It's like finding yourself uh, staying at the same hotel with REO Speedwagon or something. Um, <laughs> unexpectedly good fortune, you know. <laughs> They're still touring, by the way. And so is so it's, so it's Chris Christofferson. And they were friends with Eddie Money, by the way, too. Um, so, so let's say it was a buy, right? And, 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 uh, and you're going to buy the stock at 131. And... Uh, I don't, are you very bullish on Disney, or would you just be happy? You think it's going to backslide? Let's take a look at the uh, what, what is it? What is the option? What is the uh, stock charts tell us here? And stock charts, you know, don't knock them. They, they, um, DIS. Uh, it sure looks like it wants to touch that two 200-day moving average down at 125. I don't know. I mean, what, what do you see there? I don't know. And then there's a big gap over here. Hello, gaps need to be filled, and that's that could be bad news too. So, I'd be I'd be like wearing a few pairs of underwear on this one, um, <laughs> because unless you're thinking, well, no, I mean, maybe 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 you know what? Maybe it found support here at 1:30. Maybe it did. I don't know. Anyway, so what what view would you? Regardless, we, we want that dividend. We don't want to get scalped in the process. Hmm. All right. So, uh, and it, the MACD is not turning better quite yet, but it's almost there. you think so? I don't see that either. I, the last thing that this does is have a slope that's even more pronounced down. <laughs> Stock charts is free. The volume, the, look, note, note the exceptionally strong volume on the down move, too. That's like saying the entire Senate voted to put this guy to death. Or uh, that's, that's, I don't, don't make those kinds of jokes now, I guess. A, it would be the Senate that you need to worry about. It would be the other half. Um, so anyway, Disney looks like, uh, hey, you know what? You could be the... Hmm. Ah. And anyway, maybe the best thing to do is speculate. Maybe maybe it's trying to trace out the letter W. Also, you know, the, maybe it's a double bottom. You know, ah, maybe, maybe. Actually, maybe. Who knows? So let's go to Open Insider. There's this free site called Open Insider, which tells you uh, what what insiders are doing. And I know everybody's got bills, and they need to. Uh, here we go. Uh, and again, this is a really cool free site, not distracted by a lot of fancy graphics. Disney, um, and I know what's his face, uh, Robert Iger and his wife sell a lot of stock, but uh, Brent Woodford, he sold. Uh, he's well, that's about a swimming pool for Los Angeles. Um, Alan Braverman, senior executive vice president, and okay, he unloaded thirteen million dollars worth. There's a line from Scarface when Frank Lopez confronts Tony after coming back from South America. It says, maybe you and Sosa know something that I don't know. <laughs> if you don't want, if you've ever seen Scarface, you'll have to pardon me. But that, when, when, I always, when I see insiders just unloading like that, you know, it's like, dude, what, what's the hurry? Why, why don't you? <laughs> I, just, uh, I just lit a good bottle of gasoline in the basement. I got to go. Uh, Disney doesn't, and plus, I, 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 I try to keep these things around $5,000 in size, and you can't do that with a buy right on Disney, because you have to buy 100 shares of the stock, and to do that, you're, you're already up to 13 grand. And I know that sounds childish and catering to the pitchfork masses, but uh, anyway, so Disney, but, but let's, let's forge ahead anyway. Disney, nobody, the insiders don't like it, the chart is ambiguously good. Um, 
You think it's scary, right? Yeah, I think it's so. So I bet the options market will agree with us on the scary assessment. Um, it's currently at 131. Let's expand to look at more strike prices. Oh, 11. Thank you. Uh, um, like I said, there. Uh, God, you know, yeah. I mean, they're still quite expensive coming out to a. That's 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 five bucks. All right. So let's just say you bought the stock. You want that 88 cent dividend. That's like a dog running out for the, you know, last night's pork chop, but the UPS truck's already got three steps on them. Um, you ever hear the expression, go, run, run in front of a truck for a nickel? How does it go? You, 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 pennies to nickels or something? When you're writing like that, and then quite often you're going to get called because they're going to, so, sometimes I'm like uh, the old Uncle Remus fable, though. Don't throw me, don't take my, you know, don't buy me out at 3750 because that would mean, you know, not, I'm not making out like a bandit here, but I only, so my, my cost basis is thirty six ninety five. I'm making 55, I'm making 1.2% over a three week period. You could tell your cousins and. No, but but you'll be taken out and you'll be released from that. Uh, you can put that money back to work earlier than you would have if you had to wait till October 18th. So back, uh, and, and by the way, that's a lot of times it's, a, it's almost like a game of chicken. Come on, come on, take that divot, you know, take me out of this stock. If you get, if you write near the money or slightly in the money calls uh, to get that extra premium, and, and, and you could be like, hey, dude, go ahead, take that dividend. I'll, you know, I'll... Take that woman, or there's that Bobby Bear song about the winner. You know, ever heard the song, The Winner? Uh, the, I, I beat him up and took his old lady, and now she gets uglier and uglier every day. And uh, <laughs> but I'm the winner. So, uh, so we're buying Disney at 131, and we're and we're selling some calls that are at about 130. Let's give it. Let's give Disney the benefit of the doubt, right? Give it a few bucks of upside here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you can kind of collar the stock a little bit. Um, let's go down a little bit lower here. Yeah, yeah, here, 133. I'm let, no, let's go to 132, man. That's uh, Actually, let's go just in the money here. <laughs> okay, yeah, you know what? So, so right here, bid 370, ask 390, meaning you can get 380 for it. So you pay 131.26 for the stock. Uh, you, you subtract... Uh, uh, 380, which is uh, 127.46, right? Yeah, 127.46. Uh, uh, if it, and then you take some of that dough you just brought in selling that 131 call, and you purchase yourself <laughs> some of this insurance down here. Uh, let's go with the 127, huh? That would that might, but boys, they are expensive. But it's like sometimes the shirt that costs more is the one that lasts better and looks better. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, we're going to buy. So buy to open that. You got to log on first because we've been in the elevator here. Uh huh. So Disney. Um, no, we don't want, oh yeah, we're buying to open, you have to zoom out a little bit to give you the, we're buying to open that, so then we're going to add an option leg, selling to open the, uh, what do you say, 131, yeah, 131 call, and then we're adding the stock leg, so the whole shebang, come on now, that's not right, obviously it's not, yeah, there we go, so we can do it for a net debit here of $129.36. If push and then and then when eh, is it worth it? We have to sell at one thirty one if we're assigned. So that's only going to give us one dollar and uh, sixty four cents of profit on one twenty nine thirty six. Uh, one sixty four divided by one two nine three six. I'll give you one point two six over the next twenty two days times three sixty five divided by twenty two equals. 21%. Time is up. Um, point of parliamentary procedure. I, I, I <laughs> oh, you're right. I am up. Um, I, we have 90 days that you, if you, if you join me, 
follow the trades for 90 days. You have to pay up front, but you get all your money back within 90 days if you, if you don't like it. So uh, there's, a, there's a site that you can use. You can use Forbes.com uh, Forbes slash, oh, why did they make it so complex? Forbes.com slash money show special. All one word, all a lowercase. Money show special. Forbes.com slash money, money show special. Uh, but I'm John, and I do the premium income report, and I send out two trades like that AT&T one every Tuesday and Thursday with follow-up recommendations as needed, and uh, we've done decently, as I showed you, since 2014, and it's always fun. Thanks a lot. Oh.